Flame Horse started in probably 1994 when uh, Jeremy was playing in his first garage band and had an old Korean bass that he uh, had tightened the truss rod on so much that he the truss rod came out the back of the neck, you know. Uh, and uh, he wanted a new bass and said, you know, let's see if we can, let's see, I bet we can make one of those. We went and bought some wood, and I had a hammer, a couple of screwdrivers, and a Craftsman router. Craftsman or Sears brand tools. I don't know if you Brits are familiar with that. They're, they're not the best. We cobbled together this uh, violin-shaped solid body bass that actually came out pretty well, and he still has and plays occasionally. Made a couple of solid body guitars after that. Wanted to make an acoustic, but it was just too daunting, you know, the bending wood and all. And there were just so, so many unknowns. About that time, Charles Fox had started up his American School of Luthery. Really, the he was the first of his kind back in the 70s and went out to Healdsburg and spent a week with Charles and came back and built, you know, acoustic guitar and I must say, I hope it's been in a house fire since then. <laughs> it, it was not, you know, at the time I thought it was wonderful. The second guitar actually looked pretty good. I built it for a childhood friend of mine. I don't know if you're a Jerry Jeff Walker fan, Michael, but uh, he, he didn't write it, but he, uh, he made famous songs like Up Against the Wall, Redneck Mother. Anyway, he wrote one for Jerry Jeff Walker called Rodeo Dio Cowboy. It it looked pretty good. It still it holds up. I've seen pictures of it. It looks pretty good, but it just I've heard it since and it just sounded horrible, you know. And that's the way that's the progression of acoustic guitar making. At first it's all about just how to do it, how to fit the parts together, how to make it look like something and not come apart. And then it's about trying to make it sound like something. That's a very long answer to the question, how did we get started? My goal, just because of my personal music preferences, was to build a guitar that had as complicated, I would say, sound as possible. You know, really nice uh, finger style guitar that lots of overtones, sympathetic tones, but very balanced at the same time. The Saddle Pal, the LH-14, the Elko, those seem to be the ones that fit that sound the best. The LH-14 especially holds up for other types of playing. And we knew this guy in England that kept bitching about all our guitars, well, fret. So I got to thinking about it and pre-war Gibson guitars. I just loved the sound of every one I'd ever heard. And I I really liked the look of them also. They kind of fit what we were doing. They're smaller body guitars. Uh, they had a great sound. And as I, I looked at them more closely, I had a friend that lives here locally that had uh, three of them, in fact, made in the 30s. And he loaned them to me and I looked them over and uh, we got a plan uh, for a 37 L double O and looking at them, um, they were made very similar to the way we made our other instruments. They used uh, no scalloping on the braces, parabolic brace carving. These guitars had held up for 80 years, you know, even though they were very lightly made. Uh, some of them, the, the mahogany ones in particular, weigh like nothing. I don't know how they got them so light. I picked up ukuleles that were heavier than those guitars. None of these instruments are bluegrass guitars, you know. Uh, whenever a bluegrass guy plays one of my guitars, he just hates it. Because they're not mid-range, slap-you-in-the-face banjo killers, you know. They're much more subtle. You don't have to play them hard at all get everything out of them. Uh, I'm proud of them. You don't lose anything as you go up the neck. I mean, 
you as a player know a lot more about this than I do, but these are my observations and the things we try to accomplish. I made the acquaintance of a really fine fellow from Lubbock, Texas, a music capital of the world. Um, <laughs> They think, and I get, you know, Buddy Holly, Waylon Jennings, all of, uh, Mac, all those people. But he, uh, he's a cowboy poet and a playwright and a songwriter. And um, he's very much interested in Texas and Southwest history. Um, and he said, I want a guitar. I want a small guitar that's easy and fun to play and easy to carry around. And uh, I don't feel beat up after I've, I've played it. And he said, basically what I want is something small enough to pack on my saddle with a sound as big as Texas. That's exactly the, the uh, specifications he gave me for the first saddle pal. You know, it, it hasn't changed much, almost none from that first one, which was probably 1997 or something. You know, sometimes you just get lucky and you hit on what you're going for right off the bat. And well, it was about this time that I started uh, having dealings with a good friend of mine, uh, Irvin Samaji. So while those first two guitars were, were good, um, I came under Irvin's influence and... Um, I started doing some different things as far as uh, thicknessing and voicing the tops of the guitars. And so then I think they got even better. Uh, took one to the 1999 Healdsburg Guitar Festival where uh, a couple of, you know, really good players got a hold of them. A guy named Doug Smith. Grammy award-winning fingerstyle player and Todd Halliwell, one of the Winfield champion fingerstyle players. And Michael Bashkin came inside and he said, uh, man, you need to go outside because Doug Smith and Todd Halliwell are jamming on your guitars out there. And it's just fantastic. And I said, who's that? <laughs> you know? And uh, I said, you dumbass, just go outside. <laughs> So he sent me outside. He said, I'll watch your table for a little while. I went out there and it was, it was incredible to see these two guys playing off of one another. And um, Doug Smith did the demo for the Saddle Pal at that, at that Hillsburg. He played Stars and Stripes forever. I'll never forget it. It was just incredible. And he finished and the whole audience leapt to their feet, just cheering and clapping. Todd Hallowell ended up buying that saddle pal. And he just thought it was interesting. He liked the sound of it. He said, it gives me something to talk about in my performances because it looks a little different. And uh, I'll use it for alternative tunings. And that was 1999. And here in 2014, it's his primary instrument that he plays in concert. He, and he's ordered a second one, which I'm about finished and uh, trying to recreate that one as closely as possible. Of course, it won't be the same and it won't be as good, I'm sure, because <laughs> it's it's new. You know, the other one is, what, 15 years old now. There's no way the new one is going to sound as good as that one. But um, it's, it's remained relatively unchanged. I have found, made them with traditional sound holes and non-traditional sound holes. And I know that a lot of people are, are not particularly fond of non-traditional sound holes, like uh, Blondie that you have there, the one that was on the cover of Acoustic Guitar Magazine. But um, with a tiny guitar like that, and it is tiny, it's only 13 inch lower bow, um, to get a quality sound, we need as much soundboard as we can get. And when we shove the sound holes up into the shoulders and into the sides, sound ports, that gives more active soundboard. And I really think those instruments 
they sound better than the ones with the traditional sound holes. But that's, you know, everybody has different ideas and uh, cowboy guys, they want the traditional sound holes, you know. They fancy themselves rugged individualists, bastions of the old West, but heaven forbid that they not have a traditional looking guitar, you know. This is certainly not an original idea with us. I mean, there have been over a hundred years people have been uh, trying to find different ways of, of having the action be easily changeable and adjustable on acoustic guitars. Martin themselves did it in the late 19th century. We had made since 2002 or three adjustable necks uh, and that system worked just fine but it was it was not easy and so we've evolved to what we have now which is pretty foolproof we're under full string tension uh, a player can just look down at the how far his strings are from the frets and uh turn an allen wrench and very very accurately adjust the action to exactly where he wants it to be The get Joe. All right. Um, see, when I when I first started learning, um, we we were talking about banjos a lot, and uh, I started working under Chuck Lee, who is a amazing banjo maker in. Uh, he lives in the DFW area in Texas, and I'd go over there once a week, twice a week, sometimes. And just work underneath him and uh i i always did like the banjo and i'd always been a big fan of it but uh i uh you know i think i'm trying to remember where i first heard the guitar banjo and kind of fell in love with that specific sound it was neil young he has a song called for the turnstiles which is one of my favorite neil young songs and he just it's got a banjo in there so he's hitting these low freaking notes on the banjo. And I was like, I, I just was like, what the hell is it kind of banjo is he playing? And I did a bit of research on the interwebs as one does and figured out it was a guitar banjo and then started just kind of looking into guitar banjos in general. And then, um, you know, just got into making them, uh, you know, it's a beautiful little instrument. It's, it's so easy to move your guitar licks over to that thing. You know, and I think guitar players just love them.